Okay, welcome to the lighter side of the dark side. It's your weekly freak show here on Renegade Radio, Steel Waves Radio, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeart Radio, everywhere you listen to podcasts. This is the Dark Mark Show. I am Dark Mark, the goth comedian. I'm by myself today. Uh, it's a long story. Unfortunately, I was supposed to be with the lovely Brie Walker, who has been our guest, and hopefully we'll be able to get a recap from her or do a political show at some point. But uh, I, I'm very honored because I, I to have this guy on because I don't know who I'm voting for for president, to be honest with you. I know I'm not voting for Trump. I know I'm not voting for Biden. So far, I think my vote is going to this guy right here, Howie Hawkins. How are you, Mr. Hawkins? I'm good. Thanks for having me. And uh, I, I want to give people a little, a little uh, context of who you are, if they don't know. And I didn't know a lot of things about you, but you're a working guy. You're, you're a guy who worked at the Lowy Dock for uh, UPS for a number of years. You're a union guy, uh, veteran, former Marine. And what I didn't know, uh, and I was very interested to find out, you were very uh, much responsible for the Green Party forming. And you were the one who first proposed the Green New Deal before any of these people, before AOC, before Bernie, any of that. Is that all true? That's all true. Long before they did. I mean, I ran on it as a slogan, Green New Deal in 2010, running for governor in New York. But that was the first year. I mean, I'm talking about these policies since the 1970s. I was one of the co-founders of the Clamshell Alliance, which occupied the nuclear power plant construction site at Seabrook, New Hampshire. We got 1,414 people arrested. We were put in National Guard armories for 10 days. We were on a cover of Newsweek, Time, everything. Wow. And the anti-nuclear movement exploded. And until the Obama administration, no nuclear power plants were ordered. And at that time, we, we called ourselves the anti-nuclear slash safe energy movement. And we were worried about climate change as well as the pollutant, you know, the air pollution from fossil fuels back then and have been advocating, uh, let's build out a clean energy system based on renewables like solar and wind and made the argument. We had a group back then called him environmentalists for full employment. And we were saying there are more jobs in building out this clean energy system than there is in continuing with fossil and nuclear fuels. So I've been on this issue for almost 50 years. Yeah. But in 2010... I, 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 agree with you. I don't know how, the, how people even make the other arguments. Well, it's not an argument based on the science or the economics. It's based on the special interests. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. oh, absolutely. The Exxons and the Mobiles and the Chevrons, the Texacos have had enormous influence on domestic as well as foreign policy. And the nuclear industry has ties to the military industrial complex. So they were, you know, back in uh, the Eisenhower administration, they were worried about running out of oil in the Truman administration. And they formed a commission called the Paley Commission, which asked, what are we going to do after we run out of oil? Now, wow. with fracking, we're still not even close to that. But that's the question they asked. And the answer they gave to Eisenhower was, our future is solar. But Eisenhower, given the nuclear arms race, said, we're going with the peaceful atom, which is partly a PR thing, mm -hmm. partly a sop to Westinghouse and GE and those people in the military industrial complex, which Eisenhower understood. And that decision was made not in an election, not in a discussion in Congress. It was just made by the military industrial elites. We're going nuclear. So, you know, this has been, a, I mean, that the conclusion of that commission was we should go solar. You know, right. that's now 65 that's a, years ago. Yes, in the, in the 50s, they said to go solar. And uh, yeah, I just, um, and, and here's the thing, I've, I've been spoiled. I, I've always voted either in California or New York. And I've, there's always been a Green Party candidate for president when I voted, but I didn't know that that was not something to take for granted. Today, you actually just won ballot access in Pennsylvania, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, and the Democrats are appealing. You know, if they put as much effort, keep trying to keep us off the ballot, if they put as much effort into fighting voter suppression mm -hmm. of black voters and other likely Democratic voters like students, we have the same case in Wisconsin. Right. And there, 
the Republicans have got uh, voter ID and, and voter roll purges going on that really diminishes the black vote in Milwaukee and the student vote in Madison. And because of that, the Democrats keep losing races. And they're putting all this effort into keeping us off the ballot. We need 2,000 signatures. We collected over 6,000. Now, you can only submit 4,000. And the staff said 3,200 or something were, were, were good signatures. But they're trying to knock us off on a technicality because right. my running mate, Angela Walker, moved during the petitioning period. Mm -hmm. So they were saying uh, some of those petitions had the wrong address. But when she moved, we contacted the Wisconsin Election Commissions and said, what should we do? And we followed their instructions. Yet the Democrats were trying to bleed us dry in these court cases. I think there's we're going to win in Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Hmm? There's this misconception that uh, because of Jill Stein, uh, that's why Trump was elected, because they had her votes up and they had the votes that she was shy in certain states. However, they don't count the libertarians that voted for Gary Johnson. That would have voted for Trump. It has nothing Put up with a decent candidate, you're going to win. That's the bottom line. Yeah, before you ever get to Jill Stein, you got black voter suppression. You got the Electoral College. Yeah. The Greens didn't do any of those things. And then exit polls showed 61% of Stein voters would have stayed home if she'd not been on the ballot. But you what you don't what that say is that uh, Gary Johnson got twice as many votes as Jill Stein, and those votes probably would have gone Republican, most of them. Oh, sorry, the phone rang. What was the question? No, I said that Gary, Gary Johnson had twice as many votes as Jill Stein, and most of those probably would have gone Republican if they didn't go to Gary Johnson, the Libertarian candidate. Yeah, well, actually, you look, that the, in. you look at the exit polls. In both cases, uh, about 14 or 15 percent of the uh, Stein and Johnson votes would have gone to Trump. Yeah. About a quarter would have gone to Clinton. And in Johnson's case, 55% would have stayed home. In Stein's case, 61 would have stayed home. Uh, I'm sorry about this. Yeah, go ahead and get that if you need I'm to. On a, I'm on a podcast. So didn't I supposed to call you at 930? Okay, bye. Don't worry about it. Okay, so here's, here's, here's my first question. It's, uh, it's been, you, you took a phone call, it's been 10 minutes, now I get to the question. Why should you, why should people vote for you to be president? because I'm the strongest anti-Trump vote, particularly in a state like California where you are or New York where I am. In New York, Biden's been consistently 25% or more ahead. Yeah. In, in California, I think it's in the 30s. I mean, it's not even close. So the question is, if you're a progressive and you want what the Greens stand for, a Green New Deal, Medicare for all, mm -hmm. taxing the rich to make sure our social services and our environmental protection are funded, student debt relief, tuition-free public college. We can go down the whole list of programs that progressives want. Mm -hmm. If you want those things, vote for those things. That's the Green Party. If you vote for Biden and you want those things, Biden's opposed to all of those things. Mm -hmm. You get lost in the sauce. They don't know you want those things. You voted for Biden. Sure. You give away your voice. You give away your power. So people should vote for me if they're progressives because we have a progressive platform. And whoever's in office has to respect that. If, if we don't register what we want in the polls at the vote, then we're invisible and we get taken for granted. The Democrats think they got all the progressives in their back pocket and then they go fishing to the right for more votes and they accommodate the Republicans and keep moving everything to the right. So we got to hold our ground and vote for what we want. That's our power. That's our leverage politically. And uh, and I agree with that. And I've always voted. Uh, I, 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 that's why I vote third party. And I, I uh, you know, I've always been in states where uh, New York, and California, Democrats going to win anyway. So my vote doesn't count. The, pre the presidency, honestly. Oh, it does count. It's your vote. It counts if you vote for who you want. Yes. Yeah. No. I, look, when I got 5% running against Andrew Cuomo for governor in 2014, that was the year he wanted to run up the vote to get ready to run for president. Wanted to get more than his father, Mario Cuomo, ever got. Get more than he got when he uh, was first elected in 2010. And he got substantially less because we had 5% of the vote. Yeah. He couldn't take us for granted. And his, you know, after that election, he adopted several policies he had never supported that were in our platform. A ban on fracking, 
a $15 minimum wage, an extension of the millionaire's tax, and paid family leave. So uh, it does count. It does matter. Right. It doesn't maybe affect who actually wins the office, but it counts in the political process. Well, it counts that I, every time I voted for who I thought would make the best president, and I don't know a lot of people that can say that. But let's go with the, let's go to the individual because I know I have limited time with you. Let me get get to individual things that, uh, that you're supporting. You're supporting um, now. First off, what were you going to do about the COVID crisis that is, six months later is still going on? Invoke the Defense Production Act and have a federal program so everybody can get tested frequently. Uh, do contact tracing so those who are exposed can be traced and quarantined to see if they were infected. And that's how we suppress community spread of the virus. We've seen it done all across the Pacific Rim from New Zealand to South Korea, mm -hmm. in many countries of Europe, in most organized societies in the world, even countries like Burundi and Thailand. But we can't seem to do it. And so that, you know, that's what we should do. Now, Trump, uh, he should have been the hero of this. He should have listened to the public health uh, advice he got. And, you know, he could have said, I saved us from COVID. Instead, he gave up. He's a loser. But what did Biden do? He's been the presumptive nominee since March. He could have, he lives within commuter distance of the White House press corps. He could have convened them for socially distanced news conferences and pounded away, test, trace, and quarantine. That's what we need right now. And while he was at it, he could say we need to save the post office. We need a universal mail-in ballot option. Mm -hmm. We need that 600 unemployment supplement from the federal government extended, and so forth. Instead, he's kind of sat back and watched Trump hang himself on his own words. But we're in an emergency. We're approaching 200,000 deaths. The recent, uh, most recent study from uh, University of Washington on the epidemiology says we're going to have that doubled by election day, 400,000 deaths. And I think that makes Biden complicit because he hasn't used the platform he has to provide the leadership he says he wants to provide. So I'm, I'm starting to get as mad as him as I am at, tr at Trump. Yeah, I, um, I, I, I tend to agree with you. I mean, they both have a, uh, they both have, have a pulpit and you got to, you know, I know that it's, it's, it's a, you know, there's a presidential election, but you got to put the country above political strategy. And uh, I mean, I know that, uh, for instance, Andrew Yang helped the president with the with the with the with the checks that went out to people, and he didn't have to do that, but he did it. Um, and that's one of your one of your programs. He wanted to send a thousand dollars to everybody in the country. You want to send two thousand dollars to everybody in the country every month. Is that correct? Yes, for the duration of the emergency, and that would be put into the tax structure, so the people that don't really need it. We pay some taxes on it. Longer term, we want a guaranteed income above poverty, just build it into the tax structure. So if your income is below the poverty line, the real poverty line should be about double what it is now. If you look at self-sufficiency budgets to pay for basic needs, housing, rent, utilities, mm -hmm. food, and so forth, it should be about double what it is. But anyway, uh, if you're below, the government will send you money to get you up above the poverty line. If you're above, you would pay progressive taxes. So that program would cost at double the current uh, poverty rate, about 400 billion a year. Yang's proposal gives a thousand dollars to Donald Trump and to Warren Buffett and to Steve Bezos who don't need it. And uh, that in total costs three and a half trillion dollars, which is pretty expensive. So, you know, I believe we should have, everybody should have the right to an income above poverty. And, and what's the definition of poverty? What's the poverty line? I'm sorry, what? What's your definition of poverty? What's the poverty line? Well, the poverty line we have now is inadequate. It's three times a modest food budget as calculated in the late 50s. Mm -hmm. And they adopted that in the mid 60s. And since then, food inflation has been low, but housing, health care, and college costs have gone through the roof. Yeah. So it's, it's really inadequate. And so the self-sufficiency budgets I was referring to, when you calculate that so people can pay for their basic needs, you know, a house, a uh, shelter over them, their food, their utilities, um, then it comes to about double the current poverty line. 
So that's another thing we do. We'd, we'd raise the poverty line. Okay. So, so what would the poverty line be in that case? Well, let's see. I, you know, right now for an individual, it's about thirteen thousand dollars a year. Okay. So it would be about twenty six thousand a year. Okay. So. so and in our anybody case, that makes under twenty six thousand dollars a year gets an extra two thousand dollars, basically doubles their uh, salary. Well, if they were making thirteen thousand dollars income, they get thirteen thousand dollars over the year from the federal government to bring them up to the poverty line. Right. So it adjusts to your need. The, the problem I have with Yang's proposal is it's, it's just a thousand bucks. Even for an individual, that isn't quite the poverty line. Right. And, and it goes to people that don't need it and it's more expensive. So I think it, it should, be, uh, should be a guaranteed income above poverty. That's what Martin Luther King was demanding when they marched on Washington in the Poor People's Campaign. He never right. made it, of course, because he was assassinated, but that, that came out of the civil rights movement. And uh, but would the argument against that would be then uh, inflation would go up and the poverty line would would be inadequate in that case if everybody had had that had well that you money. would adjust you would adjust the poverty line to the cost of living okay and adjust the supplement the government would provide if you're below the poverty line accordingly and and you're also uh, saying as far as 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 long as we have the COVID crisis. Uh, no foreclosures, right? No, no cutoff of electric phones, gas, or anything like that. Yes, and what we'd have the federal government do is pay those on behalf of homeowners and mortgage holders. Okay. Uh, and that uh, benefit would be put into the tax structure. So if you're high income, uh, you would pay some taxes on it. But these are emergency measures to just keep the money flowing. Now, in the case of housing, you don't want to force landlords and all the businesses that depend on property services and management mm -hmm. to have no income and go bankrupt, particularly mom and pop, you know, landlords, which are about account for about half of the rental housing in the country. Then you're just creating a worse problem because you're making a lot of business go out of business. People lose their jobs. And well, that's the, what we're seeing now. That's what we're seeing now. Yeah. Yeah. So and the other and, thing that you're running on uh, Medicare for all. Everybody gets Medicare. Now, as you know, being recently retired, Medicare doesn't cover everything. Right. Do, does, do people have to get a Medicare supplement plan or? No, this would be, we call it uh, full and improved Medicare. It would cover all medically necessary services with no out-of-pocket costs, no co-pays, premiums, deductibles, or out-of-pocket costs for uncovered services. So, uh, it would be improved Medicare and it would cover everybody. And it would actually be cheaper than if we keep going with the system we're at. I used to get so angry at those Democratic primary debates where, you know, everybody pushing the public option while keeping private insurance were, you know, telling Sanders and Warren and Medicare for all costs too much. Well, you know what? They should have said, no, your plan costs more because the projections under the ACA if I remember the numbers right, Medicare for all is about 30 trillion over 10 years. What we got now is about 35 trillion over 10 years. Right. Because you got this massive overhead with hundreds of private insurance companies and every medical provider having to figure out if the patient is covered, what's the plan, they got to look it up, then they got a bill. And sometimes the companies say, no, we're not paying and they fight over it. That takes about a third of our healthcare spending. It's, it's insane. It's I used to work at Blue Shield. That used to be my job. I imagine. I used to work at Blue Shield. That used to be my job. I used to work at a Medicare supplement plan and figure out what's covered, what's not, and go between the doctor and the patient. That was my job. Yeah. Well, in our Medicare for All plan, we would uh, provide training to you so you could actually deliver health care, you yeah. know, in some form rather than push papers. Now, I know you're running on the Socialist USA uh, Party as well. The uh, the counter the argument, of course, to this is that the health care is not going to be as good and you're going to have to wait for it. And there's no um, there's no um, motivation to, uh, you know, to uh, treat older people that have fatal diseases and things like that. Well, no, I don't I don't believe that at all. 
uh, we spend more than twice as much as any other country and we don't cover everybody. And uh, where they do have public health insurance plans, it's really up to us. What, what the plan that uh, we're pushing is we call it uh, a community controlled national health service. So we're not only socializing the payments through a single payer, but we're socializing the delivery. So hospitals and clinics are publicly owned. Doctors, nurses, and other healthcare workers are salaried uh, public employees. And then we have locally elected health boards that administer the system locally. And from there elect state and national boards to coordinate the system overall. So we will have a voice in how the system's administered. And if we don't like the way they're treating the old people and not giving them the full care they need, we can say so. If we're in a community like the one I live in, has no doctors, no clinics, people got to walk two miles, half the people don't have cars to get to the community health center where they get their Medicaid, mm -hmm. or up the hill if they got other insurance or Medicare, or to the hospitals uh, near Syracuse University. Um, we can, if we had this, we could speak up for our community and saying, you need to put some health care resources in our neighborhood too. So uh, how that works out will be under community control and we will have a voice. You know, I'm in the Medicare system. I got a billing dispute with them. I'm having a hell of a time getting a live person on the other end of the phone so we can look at what I paid. I think I, I sent them a check and they didn't put it in my account. Although please, they please, didn't cash you're, you're giving me flashbacks now. Yeah. You're gonna have to put me on the clock now. You're giving me flashbacks. But uh, also now let's talk about, um, uh, obviously, the environment. The Green Party is about uh, green, green energy, and uh, taking care of fossil fuels. And you want to make fossil fuels eliminate eliminate them by in ten years. Yes, that's gas, that's coal, that's uh, oil, all that. Right. Uh, is that feasible? It's technically feasible. We have engineers out there in California, like Mark Jacobson who've been demonstrating this now for over a decade. I remember back in 2009, it was on the cover of Scientific American, how we could do it for the whole world. It was technically and economically feasible. And that was like a summary article and the details were published in a, I forget the name of the journal right now, but a peer reviewed journal. So the, the real question is the political will, and I think the willingness to do this through the public sector, you know, if we try to do it with tax incentives and regulations and mandates, the vested interests are going to fight us and gum up the whole works. We need to do like we did during the World War II emergency. When the federal government, through the uh, War Planning Board and the Office of War Mobilization, took over or built a quarter of the manufacturing capacity of the United States mm -hmm. in order to turn industry on a dime into the arsenal of democracy to arm the allies against the fascist axis powers. We need to do nothing less to make this rapid transition through the public sector to get to clean energy. I mean, here's where we are. The uh, last International Panel on Climate Change report on staying below 1.5 degrees rise in Celsius said we have a global carbon budget of 420 gigatons carbon and we're emitting 42 tons of gigatons carbon a year. That was three years ago. We mm -hmm. have seven years left before we're gonna blow through that budget. And on the other side of that threshold is catastrophic climate change. This is such a serious emergency. And of course, Trump calls it a climate change a hoax, but I'm afraid the Democrats are acting as if it's a hoax. Because you look at their climate policies, they're totally inadequate to the crisis. But uh, the, um, one of the arguments to this would be, even if we clean up our act completely, if you write, if we can clean it up in 10 years, no, no emissions, no fossil fuels, which, that, which is to me a serious challenge. I mean, we're talking about all the airplanes, all the cars, all, everything. There's still China, there's still India, and they're polluting as much as we are, if not more. Yeah, China's polluting more now. Yeah. China is uh, really destroying the environment, their own environment, and they have this Belts and Roads Initiative, which plans 700 coal plants to power that infrastructure. Right. It's a climate bomb. And we need to talk to them about that. 
But I think if we set a good example, then we have some credibility. Okay. You know, if everybody sits around and say, you go first, nobody's going to go. <laughs> we got to go first and provide the leadership and also demonstrate that this is an economic boom. I mean, we have an Equal Socialist Green New Deal budget on my website, HowieHawkins.us. People can look at it. Mm -hmm. It's $27.5 trillion over 10 years to rebuild all our productive systems for zero to negative carbon emissions and 100% clean energy. It creates 30 million jobs. And that's what we need right now. This is now the economic recovery program as well as the climate safety program. Well, I was gonna, I was gonna get to that. How, how, do, how do people get employed again? How do we get the jobs back? How do we get new jobs? Well, we're gonna build a public energy system which requires going from servo mechanical grids to smart grids to accommodate the distributed nature of solar and wind energy. We're gonna rebuild all our industrial processes for clean energy and zero emissions. So Portland cement, that accounts for 5% of the world's carbon emissions because you put calcium carbonate in it and the calcium hardens the cement, but the carbonate evaporates into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. So we need a new kind of cement factory or take steel production. You know, now they use coke ovens, although they're starting to move toward electric arc furnaces, but they're not gonna move to those electric arc furnaces until they wear out the coke ovens. So we've got to take it into the public sector and, and accelerate that. And so, you know, we go through all the productive systems that make those changes. And uh, that's how, you know, building these new Green New Deal factories is one way we employ a lot of people. We employ 4 million people alone in a new civilian conservation corps. So we can replant these forests that are burning down and restore right. ecosystems and habitat. So we have less species extinctions, which destroy ecosystems, which will destroy agriculture. I mean, there's so much work to do restoring our environment. So there's a lot of work to be done there. And there's one candidate he's talking about, and that's Howie Hawkins. Now, I, 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 I could talk to you forever, but I've got uh, just a few more questions and I'll let you go because I know we have limited time. Um, the military. You want to get out. You want to get out of all the wars, which I agree with. Pull out of the Middle East, all of that, right? Yes. And the, the the argument against that is, if you do that, then the the uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, it's all going to be stabilized. They're all going to attack Israel. Uh, it's going to be chaos. And right now, we're holding it together. We can't do that. No, we destabilize them by intervening. Going back to the Carter administration when we started supporting the Islamic fundamentalists against the government of Afghanistan. And it was Brzezinski's strategy to draw in the Russians or the Soviets into their own Vietnam. And that totally destabilized, destabilized Afghanistan. And then we invaded Iraq in 2003. It's still a mess. Mm -hmm. We're now engaged in 14 shooting wars where U.S troops are engaged in combat. Right. It keeps accelerating and we're creating more terrorists than we're killing because we do these drone strikes and mm -hmm. too many civilians are killed. Then they get mad and they want to get revenge. It's understandable. Tomorrow is 9-11 and we use this as a celebration for militarism. You know, we should listen to the CIA concept of blowback. When we go mess in other people's business, they get mad and come back at us. Well, that's, so, yeah, I mean, what happened with, with uh, even with the Democratic leadership, uh, Libya, was it disaster? Yeah, Libya, the coup in Honduras, yeah. they grabbed Zelaya in his pajamas and flew him out of the country. They did the same thing to Aristide in Haiti. He landed in Africa still in his pajamas. It's crazy. We have no right to do that. And then, you know, you look at the Pew, uh, polling uh, organization has polled the world and asked what country is the greatest threat to peace. And the U.S. always comes up on top of those polls because right. we're fighting all over the world. We have over 800 foreign military bases and we think we're exceptional. We can tell other people what to do, but they shouldn't you know, mess with us. That just doesn't work. So what we're calling for are peace initiatives because we're into a new nuclear arms race. We are modernizing our nuclear weapons 
started that under Obama, it's continued under Trump, is destabilize the nuclear balance of terror. The Russians and the Chinese have followed suit. So now the bullets and the atomic scientists, as their doomsday clock, the closest it's ever been to midnight. Right. So we're calling for deep cuts in military spending. In orderly I mean, withdrawal- When you say deep, you mean like 75%? 75%, right. And we'll still have the world's largest military budget. Um, an orderly withdrawal out of all these foreign military bases and wars. Uh, pledging no first use of nuclear weapons, disarming to a minimum credible deterrent, and then going to the other nuclear powers and saying, okay, we're not threatening you anymore. Let's uh, agree to complete a mutual nuclear disarmament because these weapons should never be used. Because if we start using them, nobody's going to win. Everybody's going to lose. It's going to be basically the end of humanity. Right. And we should go there with world public opinion. Three years ago, 122 nations agreed to a new treaty on a prohibition of nuclear weapons. The International Campaign for the Abolition of Nuclear Weapons got the Nobel Peace Prize for that. And hardly anybody in our country knows that because the political leadership of both parties, all the presidential candidates, and uh, then and following them, the corporate media doesn't talk about it. Right. It should be a top campaign issue. It's a life or death issue. So that's what I think we, we need peace initiatives. Well, I agree, I agree with you. And, and this is coming from a former Marine. You're, you're, no, you're no wimp. You're, uh... Uh, I mean, people have a right to defend themselves. I have no problem with that. But when we go invading Iraq, it's not about defending us. I mean, all that nonsense about they participated in the 9-11 attacks, which wasn't true. Yeah. They have weapons of mass destructions, including a nuclear weapon that they might use on us. It wasn't true. No. And the intelligence community actually knew that. And we had intelligence people there like Scott Ritter and UN inspectors like Scott Ritter and uh, Hans Blix that were saying, we've been scouring the country. There's nothing here. Let us keep looking. And, you know, Bush pulled them out because they had planned to go to war even before he got into office. Right. I know. I know. That's uh, it's just great. It, it, the odd thing is that it strikes me, although I think uh, getting out of the nuclear treaty is the biggest disaster that is happened when, since he's been president, that Trump is a little more dovish than, than Biden. Yeah, I, I don't think that's true. He says that, mm -hmm. but his actual, the number of troops deployed in the Middle East and North Africa is up. Right. He's radically escalated drone strikes. Right. And right. special operations forces are still operating, doing missions in over 100 countries. So, you know, he withdrew a couple, says he's going to withdraw a couple thousand troops from Iraq. Yeah, well, we'll see. He said that about Syria. Yeah. And what he actually did was betray the Kurds who had fought ISIS. And then he said, oh, we're going to grab the oil fields as if it's our oil. You know, that's just old-fashioned imperialism. Well, I, I just have a couple, couple more questions for you. One is from my friend who's 12 years old, Johnny in uh, Las Vegas. And uh, he wants us to know... Um, Hold on one second. He, he, he wanted to know, oh, yeah, he, he wanted to know what the difference is between you and Bernie Sanders and, uh, and what you do, what, what your plan and your Green New Deal, why it's better than Bernie Sanders' Green New Deal. Well, the big difference between me and Bernie Sanders is he didn't talk about these issues of militarism. He just really didn't have a big program in that, didn't emphasize it. On the Green New Deal, I have to say he was the only Democrat that had a serious plan. The rest of them were not serious. Mm -hmm. Now his was uh, 16.7 trillion or 16.3 trillion over 10 years. We're 27 and a half trillion over 10 years because we want to zero out emissions by 2030. Right. His goal was 2050. Although I have to say he wanted to get energy and transportation sectors, which is a little bit over half the emissions done by 2030. So I respect what he did I think what we did in his uh, policy people didn't do is we show our homework on our website, mm -hmm. how much it's going to cost. We cite our sources, how many jobs it will create. And so you can see how we went work through it in that budget. His materials are just basically the conclusion. So you can't see their homework. Right. But, you know, I think Bernie had a good program, certainly the only serious one coming from a Democrat. But I mean, you, so, you go back with Bernie a long way. You, that was one of your first political things was, I uh, worked for his campaign in, in the 70s. Yeah, back in the 70s. Um, I think another difference between us is 
He just wants to tax the billionaire class. And the problem with that is that concentrated wealth, which they still retain, and you tax them to fund the social programs, that translates into concentrated political power, which means they can fight, resist, and roll back those programs. We want to have social ownership and democratic administration of major means of production, the big banks and industries. So they're under democratic control and not just the wealthy elite controlling them and through them, the political process. So that's really democratic socialism that we're talking about. He was only really talking about New Deal liberalism. Now I've known him long enough that he understands what I'm talking about, but he didn't campaign on it and we are. Right, because because there's, there's, there's two questions with this would be, um you know, how these people that have the power now that control the banks, I mean, how are, how are you going to get them to, to, uh, to loosen control so you can take, take over the banks and take over the, and how do you ultimately pay for all this? Well, the way to get control is to, like we did during World War II, say, uh, this is in the public interest. We're taking over. We're going to compensate you here on long-term bonds. You're still going to have plenty of money coming in, but they're now under democratic control. Um, and how do we pay for it? Uh, like any good business investment, over time, the revenue should cover the costs. So as we build these uh, public housing and public energy and public transportation, we're going to get revenues from public housing rents, public transportation fares, uh, electricity fees, that's being produced through a public energy system. And that will cover the costs over the long term. That's one of the good things in Bernie's plan is he did want a public energy system expanding on the federal energy administrations that we already have. And he did say his program would be paid for over the long term, which right. I think it would. And the last question, which uh, is a silly one, and I'm not going to ask about your uh, accent, which is a very lilting, almost Nolan's accent, but you grew up in San Francisco. Uh, I've already heard about that, but uh, the two main third party candidates, the two that have a chance of becoming president from the Electoral College are you, Howie Hawkins, and the Libertarian candidate, Joe Jorgensen. How did two illiterate names get on the ballot at the same time? How did this happen? You mean JJ and HH? Yeah. Uh, I think it's just coincidence. Okay. That just, I just wanted to, I figured as much, but it just, it, it's, and let me tell you something. It's uh, you've impressed me today. I got to tell you uh, because you know I'm not. You know I'm I'm a mix with my politics. I usually vote third party. The Democrats and Republicans have nothing for me. But I'm going to definitely go to your website, Howie Hawkins. Give me the website again. HowieHawkins.us. HowieHawkins.us, and I'm very impressed that, like you said, you're not just taxing the rich. You have you have plans that, uh, uh, you know, that are going to get people back to work and make sure that everybody thrives. That's right. That's the goal. All right. Well, I got to tell you, you have my vote, Howie. Thank you. I, 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 and uh, so you got my vote. You got, uh, you got Bree Walker's vote. So that's two in California, two in the bank for you. And uh, I, I urge everybody that's listening to this to at least – Go to your website, look at what you look at what you're proposing, and check you out and, and have an open mind. You don't have to vote for Trump, you don't have to vote for Biden, you vote for whoever you want. <laughs> Anything any last words, Howie? I don't know how to end this. I think what you said is important. You know, don't give away your vote, don't give away your power. Vote for what you want and make the politicians come to you. If you settle for Biden and you're progressive, uh, you're just basically silencing yourself. So vote for what you want and uh, exercise your power. And the main thing is if you get 5%, you get matching funding for the next election, the Green Party does. If we get 5%, we get $20 million at least for the general election for the Green ticket in the fall right. of 2024. Because I got to tell you, the last time I was excited about politics, I went to a Ralph Nader rally in 2000 in Madison Square Garden. And so all the people that say Ralph Nader cost Al Gore the election, Ralph Nader was playing at 8% in October, got less than 3%. So who took votes away from who? 
And if Ralph Nader got 5%, you'll be in a much stronger position right now. Yeah, I think if we'd have done it that year, uh, we would have been able to build upon it because we didn't have the resources. And back then, there was another pot of public money that was removed during the Obama administration. And it was the money that went to the major parties for their conventions. Right. But for the Green Party, it would have uh, enabled us to help our state parties get better organized on their way to the convention. We could have used that money for that, but that money's been eliminated. Right. Well, Howie, I, uh, I, I started calling you Mr. Hawkins. I'm calling you Howie now. Yeah. I appreciate you. I know we're a little over time. I appreciate you sticking around with me. And, uh, and uh, good luck. I, I, I'm rooting for you to get 5%. You got my vote. And uh, I hope everybody at least has an open mind, checks you out, because especially people don't like the choices that you have with the Democrats and Republicans. What do you got to lose? We, we got a lot to gain. That's exactly That's, I think, the way to look at it. Thanks a lot, Howie. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Since the most terrifying thing I can think of right now is this election, I have decided to, uh, actually, I'm very honored to have the Libertarian candidate for president, Joe Jorgensen, joining me on the show today. Hi, Joe. Hey, so glad to be here. I'm sorry, Dr. Jorgensen. I don't know. I just, <laughs> I've, I've been watching your videos. I said, you know, I'm so familiar with you. Yeah. How about Dr. Joe? We'll compromise. Okay. <laughs> like well, Dr. Phil, I'll be Dr. Joe. Well, I, uh. I prefer you to Dr. Phil. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> nobody here is going to say catch me outside. How about that? But um, uh, uh, first question, and I know we have limited time, uh, and I have some questions from our audience. Uh, why should people vote for you to be to be president? Why should you be president? Because I'm the only one who says that you know better how to spend your money and you know what your family needs more than any special interest or bureaucrat in Washington does. That the other two guys both want to spend your money, both want to make decisions for you. Neither one has an answer to the crushing health care costs and neither one is going to bring the troops home. Well, and that, that opens up the question now uh, uh, as far as crushing health care costs. How would you... Uh, deal with that. That's definitely a, uh, uh, especially with the, with the coronavirus, it's a, it's a pressing issue right now, maybe the most pressing issue. Yeah, well, first of all, we've got to turn it towards a free market. And if there's one message I could get to every American voter, it's that we do not have a free market system in healthcare, and we haven't in almost a century. They keep saying, well, the free market didn't work, so I guess we'll have to go to single payer. But when I hear them say we need Medicare for all, what I'm hearing them say is we need VA hospital for all. And that top-down monopoly doesn't work for anyone. The argument to that, though, would be if you leave it to the free market, you get things like uh, the guy uh, that uh, made the EpiPen and just overcharged uh, everybody. Wait a minute. We've got government-run health care now. We don't have a free market and the guy with the EpiPen overcharged. So I would suggest in a free market, people... Buy their, um, buy their things based on both price and quality. Right now, uh, computers are pretty much a free market. So are cars. So when you go out to buy your computer, buy your car, buy your groceries, you can shop around for the best price. Right now, we've got the FDA, which is a monopoly on accepting uh, new patents, and it takes about a billion dollars and 10 years to get a new drug to market. So basically, only those companies that are large enough, even and get FDA approval. And once they do, they weaponize our patents with monopoly and we're left with the EpiPen. And uh, I, what uh, the, the most pressing crisis right now is this uh, coronavirus is COVID. What would you do to, uh, to alleviate this crisis? Well, first of all, we've got to get rid of the FDA obstacles that are preventing us from getting tested. And that's the biggest mistake that Trump made was not getting rid of those obstacles, because if we had been tested like the citizens in South Korea, we would have known who could have gone out to work and who needed to stay home. And we wouldn't have had to have lost tens of millions of jobs. Right. And how would uh, the how would you get these jobs back? That's uh... Well, first, yeah. first of all, by leaving the money in the hands of the taxpayers, because research is pretty clear that money left in the hands of individuals and companies create about twice as many jobs as that same money turned over to the government. And uh, 
I also, I, um, cause I, I actually t- tend to lean libertarian. However, honestly, uh, what has gotten me off that is, um, co- the corruption of corporations. And yeah, you- and you're, you're absolutely right. And why are corporations corrupted? Because they get their power from congressmen. Do you know there are corporations who actually write bills? They will write their bill, give it to their congressperson, and then their congressperson uh, puts it in, you know, suggests it, and, and they vote on it. And I want companies to only get big by pleasing us, by making sure that we get the best price for the best quality. Right now, they don't have to do that. All they have to do is please the congressman. That's why we need to get away from the Democrat and Republican system and get to a libertarian system. I, and and uh, you're preaching to the choir there. The Democrat and Republican parties has failed. And I think um, foreign policy is another uh, issue where I definitely oh. agree. Well, if I well, if you don't mind my asking, because when you said you were kind of moving away from the Libertarian Party, I thought you meant back to the Democrats and Republicans. Oh no! Oh no! So where, so where are you moving towards? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I honestly, my, um, my philosophy is is a mix of, and it, it seems weird because they're diametrically opposed, opposed is the Green Party and the Libertarian Party, rather but, than, and and there's a lot of there's a lot of common ground there. I don't see any at all. In fact, the Green Party simply wants to give more power to the Congress people and take it away from the average person. I want to give power back to the average person. Right. I I mean, as far as socially, as far as uh, militarily, there's some there's some there's some crossover. Um, Yeah, I'm not I haven't heard them say that they're going to bring all the troops home, but perhaps if they do. But if you want to, I mean, Regardless of them, what I I'm, I'm, I really want to know what what you want to do as far as militarily because I mean we're in these endless wars and they're just yep. and 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 they're privatized. Yep, I agree with you. I agree with you. We have to bring the troops home. In fact, that's what that's my plan of what to do the very first day in office is to bring the troops home because as commander in chief, I can do that. I don't need Congress. We are in 150 different countries around the world and uh, we spend more than the next seven countries combined. We've got to put an end to that. There's no reason why taxpayers in Alabama should be paying for the military of France. I Absolutely. And uh, the other, um, the other issue I have, uh, as I said, is, uh, is climate change. Yeah. Oh, oh, what, what, yeah. Is your opinion on, what is your opinion on climate change and how would you deal with it? Yeah. In fact, I can talk the rest of the time about climate change, uh, but because that's that's one of my personal top three issues. I think it's really important. But by the way, let me add one more thing about bringing the troops home. Mm-hmm. Uh, we keep hearing how great France is and how they get five week vacations. Well, maybe we'd get five week vacations, too, if we weren't paying for their military. But if we have... <laughs> If we have Green Party socialist things, then we'll just be where we are, you know, in France, um, with uh, except without somebody to support our military. But anyway, so if you first of all, if you get out a globe and look around the earth, you will see that wherever there's big government, there's more pollution. Wherever there's less government, there's less pollution. And it was very frustrating to me when I was in a third party debate in March. Um, The woman who was running for the socialist ticket pointed out in her closing, she said, you know, the the United States, the Department of Defense is the largest polluter on earth. And then her very next sentence was about how awful corporations were to the environment. And I thought, are you listening to yourself? If the U.S. government is the largest polluter on the face of this earth, then why would you go to those people to solve it? Why do you go to the very people who are creating the problem to solve it? That's usually not the way you solve any problem. And I've got two examples of how a free market would work. The first one, and and I would recommend, if you haven't heard of this group called PERC, it's P-E-R-C, they're out of Bozeman, Montana. Anybody who's interested in the environment, I suggest to check them out. I met with two wonderful women from uh, that uh, organization. And they told me about, uh, this was a local thing in Montana where there were trees and the government was going to sell off the rights for somebody, you know, to cut down the timber, right? So 
uh, a timber company was going to come in and uh, chop them down. Well, the local residents were saying, you know, we kind of like the trees there. Maybe we should bid on that as well. And so they bid on it. They were shocked to find out that they outbid the timber company. And then they were like, oh my gosh, now what do we do? Now we got to raise money. Well, I wasn't surprised at all that they were able to raise um, the money they needed in just two weeks, because of course a lot of people are interested in the environment. But here's the here's the bad part. You know, if the story ended there, everything would be great. But what happened was uh, the the Montana legislature came back and they changed the law so that could never happen again. So that the timber companies will always win. That's why we absolutely cannot put the government in charge of the environment because. They're the ones that get to office by uh, special favors, by campaign contributions, and they're always going to have to pay back those favors. And last, the uh, Gulf oil spill. A lot of people looked at that and said, well, see, we need government, you know, because the corporations don't care about the environment. But what they don't know is that the government had give, given them a liability cap. So that if they did have a catastrophe, as they did, they wouldn't have to pay for the cleanup. So in a free market, the company would have had to have gone to an insurer, a private insurer, and the insurance company would have either said, nope, we're not going to insure you because it's too risky. Or the insurance company would have said, okay, we'll tell you what, we'll insure you, but it's kind of risky. So we'll we'll go out and we'll, we'll insure you, but we're going to go out there every week, every month, whatever, and spot check the rigs to make sure that everything's safe and in order because we don't want to have to pay a claim. So you have the profit mode of working to keep the environment clean. Instead, what happened was the Congress people just went, oh, well, oh, well, oops, too bad, you know, our bad oil spill, we'll just let the taxpayers clean it up. It was no skin off of their nose. People in Congress are not going to care about it. We, we've already seen that with what they've done. Uh, all you have to do is look at what the Congress has done to date with the environment. Mm -hmm. So I want to put people like the wonderful people in Montana in charge. I want to put the Audubon Society, Ducks Unlimited. I want, I want people who care about the environment to be able to protect the environment environment instead of turning it over to the greedy politicians who all they care about is where their next campaign contribution comes from. Which begs the question, if you're elected president, and I, I'm crossing my fingers, that would be great. If everybody did not like Trump and Biden voted for you, it would be a landslide. But uh, if you were elected president, you would have a Democratic and Republican controlled yeah. corrupt, as Trump and Biden both are, <laughs> Congress. How would you deal with that? Well, my quick answer is I'm a teacher. I know how to handle problem students. <laughs> my long answer is, unlike Ronald Reagan, I'm not going to simply sign every budget, every bill that comes my way. If they send me a, a budget that is not balanced, that's not smaller than the previous year, I'll send it back. I know how to grade enough paper. Uh, I'll send a budget back 20 times if I have to. Now, could they override me? Yeah, they could with a lot of work, but I would point out that, hey, um, if you want your cush jobs and you want to get reelected again, you better follow my lead because they put me here as president and this is what they want. So. Yeah, you've uh, you slapped my knuckles with a ruler a couple times here. Uh, <laughs> let, me, let me ask because I, I have not, I've, I've, I've gone over your views and as I said, I wish we had more time. I, I, I could talk to you for hours, but yeah. I, I know you, I know you're pressed for time and I appreciate you taking the time out. Abortion. What is your, uh, what is your position on that? Of course, we've got 30 seconds left and that's what you asked me. Um, I would say it's conflicted within the party, just like outside the party. The Libertarian Party says that the government should stay out of it. However, even the staunchest pro-choice Libertarian politician would never spend a single penny of taxpayers dollars for abortions for Planned Parenthood for anything like that and Republicans can't say that so but yeah now we have passed my time so I would like to mention my website which please is go right ahead you have the rest of the time it's uh, joe20.com, that's jo20.com, and about 75% of our volunteers are from outside the party, so it, they, they're just telling me that the old system is broken and they want something different. So I'd love to have your people check me out. Absolutely. I, I recommend everybody check you out and, and, and really look at you and your platform before you vote. And if you get 5% of the national vote, 
that's a win. Yep. If I get 5% in Minnesota, it's a win. I appreciate it. Dr. Dr. So Joe, thank you so much for being with me. One, one more quick question, if I may. Okay. Why are the two uh, third part, the, the two highest rated third party candidates, Joe Jorgensen and Howie Hawkins, why do they both have a litter of names? Is this a good <laughs> That's a good question. Although my name is kind of like Chris Christofferson because it's Joe Jorgensen. My first name is in my last name. So <laughs> I'm unique in that regard. <laughs> I'll, uh, I, so it's, it's a possible conspiracy, but good luck to you. I hope you get, I hope you win, but I hope you, you get 5% of nothing else. I'd be happy with that. So thanks. We'll catch you later. Thank you, Dr. Joe. Yeah.